On February 14th, Canada's federal government, led by Justin Trudeau, invoked the Emergencies Act for the first time in history. The federal government has invoked the Emergencies Act. This was the responsible and necessary thing to do. The law allows the government to take extraordinary measures, including the suspension of civil liberties, to restore order when a crisis seriously endangers the sovereignty, security, or territorial integrity of the country. The federal government is ready to use more tools at its disposal to get the situation fully under control. The predecessor to the Emergencies Act is the War Measures Act, which was only used three times in Canadian history. During the First and Second World Wars, it was invoked to forcibly intern Canadians of German, Ukrainian, Italian, and later Japanese descent. In 1970, it was used by Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau after a domestic terrorist organization kidnapped and executed a Quebec Labour Minister. What crisis precipitated the invocation of the Emergencies Act? What grave threat justified the extraordinary suspension of civil liberties, the forced dispersal of protesters, and the freezing of their bank accounts? For one month, a protest movement led by long-haul truckers had encamped outside of Parliament Hill in Ottawa, the nation's capital, demanding an end to COVID-19-related lockdown policies and vaccine mandates. Through the pandemic, they delivered essential services to Canadians, but were now defending civil liberties and standing up to two years of increasingly draconian and burdensome public health measures. To their supporters, the truckers were heroes. But to others, they were deemed aggravators. In extreme cases, they were labeled domestic terrorists bent on overthrowing Canada's democracy and endangering the health of its citizens. Harassment, threats of rape, racist, misogynistic, homophobic attacks. We live in a divisive climate to say the least. But what really happened? And how did we get here? When the pandemic first hit, we didn't know anything about the disease. There was footage from China of people collapsing dead in the streets. There were rumors that it may have been a lab-engineered supervirus or possibly a bioweapon. We didn't know how serious it was. We didn't know how easily it spread, how it spread, or how to treat it. We didn't know who was at risk or how deadly it would be. We saw China locking down entire cities, welding people into apartment buildings to prevent them from leaving their homes. We were scared. If China's response was to control the virus by suspending civil liberties, maybe we had to as well. Maybe call me Marker. I think the most generous thing you could say is that it was a sincere effort to try to save lives or prevent deaths. 
listening to what was going on in the news, seeing what was going on in China, you know, and hearing that if I wear a mask and you wear a mask, we'll protect each other and we'll go about our business after two weeks of being locked down. And I felt like, okay, well, we can do this. You know, I had to lay off 50, 60 people within a matter of 24 hours and still try to maintain our business was considered, I suppose, essential. COVID-19 has taken a toll on Canada's economy. April job numbers reveal the unemployment rate has hit 13% and nearly 2 million Canadians lost their jobs. That was what, what it was. It was trying to buy us time, which is, you know, which is where that two weeks to flatten the curve came from. Let's give it a little more time to sort things out. Let's try not to overwhelm our ICU resources. And so let's try to keep this at, at bay. I wanted to be part of the solution. I started making masks with uh, um, Mask Makers YYC, which is just so crazy when I look back at it now that we started this initiative with our business and um, a whole bunch of people in the community who were giving donations of fabric and going around the city and, and we were using our vans to distribute that when there was no PPE. Word trucking for freedom, interview take one, AB Common Mark. They had actually shut everything down. And I was like, whoa, what's going on here? But honestly, I, I thought it would be temporary. I didn't think it was going to be anything sustainable. I was quite accepting of it. And I think uh, most politicians uh, just did what seemed like the cautious thing to do and it, it kind of made sense at that time. On the surface, Canadians were willing to do what was within their power to help keep each other safe and prevent the spread of the virus. You don't want to take away from all the, the work uh, our doctors and nurses and all the essential workers did because I mean they some people just did a, a, amazing jobs, they exposed themselves to the virus, etc. But overall the the, the leaders I believe made a fundamental state mistake. It should have been focused protection all along. Many small businesses didn't survive lockdowns. If you're forced to cut the data on one dimension to really describe who's getting hit, it's the distinction between hourly and salaried workers. This is something that has hit hourly paid workers and in particular lower paid hourly paid workers. So it's been very unequally distributed. As time passed, people began to question the validity of many public health measures, which seemingly made less and less sense. My name's uh, Eric Payne. I'm a uh, pediatric neurologist. I'm also uh, an assistant professor. I have a master's of public health um, from Harvard University where I got expertise in statistics and epidemiology. I spent six years on staff at the Mayo Clinic um, working as a consultant in neurology and in adult epilepsy. I'm also uh, a father of three small children. With respect to traditional vaccines, remain very much pro-vaccine. All my kids are vaccinated, I'm fully vaccinated. And so, you know, the, the estimates coming out of Imperial College London, which really fueled actually that decision to lock everything down. I think it was Neil Ferguson put those out. It suggested, you know, over 1% of the entire human population was going to die from COVID. And that uh, this would be like the Spanish flu of 1918, an absolutely uh, devastating pandemic that, uh, that killed uh, minimally 20 million people at a time when the world's population was barely a quarter of what it is now. Most of the people there killed in the Spanish flu were in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. They were in the prime of life, and it left many children orphans. By March or April, we already had very good information telling us that the people that were most vulnerable were our elderly and those with comorbidities, meaning, you know, other medical conditions. And yet our policies didn't reflect this. Efforts were not exclusively focused on the elderly or the most vulnerable. We saw broader measures, including closures to parks, playgrounds, and schools. From the get-go, we were told that if you were, if you even questioned 
lockdowns, that you were anti-science, or you were lacking compassion and you just didn't care about saving lives, or both. And so, you know, this is this is where it gets gets really interesting because as you know, anybody who spreads misinformation these days is attacked, cancelled, and, and that is that is the attack, is, is that you're spreading misinformation. You're spreading disinformation, and, and by not being one harmonious voice with the, the medical powers that be, uh, we know we're, we're causing trouble. I always say, like, we're, we're just in this highly narcissistic relationship with our government. Some of the people that have experienced, I think, any sort of domestic violence, for example, or have been in a, a toxic relationship with someone, the signs are shockingly the same. You're not allowed to question. If you do, it's like your, your reality's kind of shifted. The goalposts keep changing. So one day there's a rule, and the next day that rule has changed all of a sudden. There were just too many links that way. And so it just felt very, very toxic. You know, it was crazy. Some of my friends, you know, quite enjoyed it because they weren't in the office, they didn't have to pay for parking, you know, they would get to work from home. And that was the lockdown class. The people that were rooting for it didn't see a problem with it. As that first year went along, I watched what they were doing, looking at the stats of like what, how many people die from addictions. And there wasn't even a close comparison. And there was no uproar in our society over the pandemic of opioid use or crystal meth or, you know, cocaine or alcoholism. And people are dying from that on a daily basis in greater numbers than COVID ever produced. Because we were making every effort to reduce COVID, the end result was we had uh, a pretty good outcome. The numbers were staying low, but that came at a cost. The idea of locking everybody down for two years, you know, that's not part of any response plan. Um, and frankly, that was part of my concern as this was emerging. Some of the most experienced and best brains in public health signed what was called the Great Barrington Declaration. And they were saying just that, you know, we need to focus on, on, on protecting the most vulnerable. And these widespread lockdowns are likely to cause more harm than good over time. Been 40 epidemiologists and public health scientists from all over the world who say they come from both the right and the left are making waves amid the pandemic. That's because they reject shutting down the economy to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. They're calling their position the Great Barrington Declaration. The doctors say, quote, current lockdown policies are producing devastating effects on short and long-term public health, including lower childhood vaccination rates, worsening cardiovascular disease outcomes, fewer cancer cancer screenings and deteriorating mental health. Schools closed, businesses were shuttered, people were scrambling to figure out how they were going to make ends meet. Holiday parties were canceled, families were told to keep gatherings to a minimum. Our lives were totally upended. Staying at home will objectively reduce the numbers of ICU admissions, it'll reduce the number of ER visits, but that certainly has an effect on, on quality of life. We need to think how to support families through this crisis. This is not workers, you know, choosing themselves to quit jobs. This is workers being told, you need to go home, right? They went on to say that a more measured way of doing this, a more compassionate way, is to allow extremely low-risk youth, our children, college students, and the younger workforce, to live life as normal. Let them go back to work. Let them go back to school. Let them even socialize and have a good time. When you hit rock bottom for whatever reason, it hurts. And I think that we, we really need to heal as a society because A, there's been way too much division, but B, there's just been so much sadness and grief and loss. I came to believe there was something fundamentally wrong with lockdowns when I wrote to governments in April, so barely a month into it, and I said, have you considered the lockdown harms? Are you seriously 
monitoring, not, not just a cursory, yeah, yeah, we, we know that this is really hard for some people, N not just a brief acknowledgement. Are you actually studying the harms and trying to wrap your head around the extent and the nature of the harms? And the answer was an emphatic no. There's not a single government in Canada, not the federal government, no provincial government that was making a sincere, concerted, thorough effort to diligently document and find out the extent of lockdown harms. Personally, um, I, I haven't seen my daughter for um, going on three years. She lives in Australia, and so um, I can't I can't leave the province. And so many people don't realize that Canada is so locked down. There is no other country in the world that has locked down provinces right now as of today. We're we're it. So I can't get on a plane and go see my cousins or friends in Canada, let alone get on a plane and see my child in another country right now. Our government, other governments, along with media and social media companies, took many actions that over time undermined trust. As new COVID cases, hospitalizations and deaths all start to rise again for the fourth time in this country. Dr. Walensky is a scientist. She is not prone to hyperbole. She sticks to the facts and the data. When she talks about having a sense of impending doom, that seems like something we ought to listen to. What I really would hate to have happen is to have another oncoming surge just as we're, we're reaching towards getting so many more people vaccinated. You know, we're still losing people at a thousand deaths a day. When the vaccines were rolled out, we were told that they were safe and effective. Fully vaccinated people could not get or transmit the virus and herd immunity was within reach. Politicians said the vaccines would not be made mandatory. Vaccine passports were described as a conspiracy theory, but perhaps the biggest one. There's one message that needs to cut through all this. The vaccines are safe. I promise you, they are safe and effective. Remember, these vaccines are safe. They've passed Canada's world-class standard for medical approvals. These vaccines work. They're one of the best ways to keep yourself and others safe. Did the vaccine in the summer of 2021 work? Absolutely. Uh, Alberta Health Services clearly outlined the number of ICU admissions and the number of hospitalizations and the rate of people who were vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And those numbers are fairly compelling. The numbers demonstrate that if you were vaccinated, the chances of being admitted to hospital for ICU or, or to be hospitalized was significantly reduced. And they told us that once enough people got the vaccine, about 70% of adults, the lockdowns would end and life would go back to normal. <laughs> so, you know, they didn't even say vitamin D. Nothing. There's nothing you can do. They said, just if you get really sick, phone an ambulance and someone will pick you up and take you to the hospital. And this is literally what they're telling people. It is so insane. Prior to this, no mRNA vaccine had ever been approved. Our children and families want us to be healthy. That's why I and lots of other grown-ups got the COVID-19 vaccine. Globally, medical experts are endorsing the safety of COVID-19 vaccines. A vaccine uses just a part of the germ that can't make you sick. Vaccination against COVID-19 can help kids get back to being kids. Every vaccination brings us closer to the moments we miss, like seeing our friends and family. Thanks, son. What we're seeing right now is that the overwhelming majority of cases in Canada are in people who haven't been fully vaccinated yet. Governments were forced to make quick and difficult decisions when rolling out these vaccines. This was 
um, you know, a genetic vaccine that was for the, you know, going to cause your own body to produce this spike protein. People are trying to use this technology in terms of even treating cancers, and there, 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 there could be, you know, some really beneficial aspects to this. The beginning of September, when we knew that the effectiveness of these current vaccines against the Delta variant, effectiveness had dropped below 50%. Um, and so they dropped the term immunity from the definitions of, from the CDC, and they changed it to provide protection. And that definition had not changed in a very, very long time. Now, first on the vaccine mandates, being vaccinated and boosted neither protects you from contracting the virus nor spreading it. We're like bred and taught to be like, like vaccine is safer than, than actually getting COVID. Now, a fantastic piece today in the Wall Street Journal correctly notes, one preprint study found that after 30 days, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines no longer had any statistically significant positive effect against Omicron infection. The vaccines that we have today have proven to be both safe and effective, including uh, against the variants. So today we're seeing the prime minister and his wife getting the AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca vaccine. The vaccines were not as effective as initially hoped. They were effective at attenuating the severity of symptoms and reducing the risk of death. But unlike the vaccine for polio or smallpox, they did not provide sterilizing immunity. They were what epidemiologists call a leaky vaccine, meaning you can still catch the virus, still get sick, still transmit it to other people, possibly unknowingly. That meant that herd immunity could not be achieved with these vaccines. Even if 100% of people got the vaccine, COVID-19 would still circulate and sicken people. I mean, you don't want to get sick. Listen to Dr. Fauci. These vaccines work well, against this virus, including the Delta variant. We just need to get more and more people vaccinated. Listen to the scientists to develop them through extensive and rigorous review. I did. I know you're a kid, if you're a kid at this point. <clears throat> Do so if you have grown-ups in your life, have them get vaccinated. Because there's a bit of a self-selecting bias there. If you say to yourself that these things are 100% effective and safe, um, then you're not going to entertain any information that suggests that they're not 100% effective and safe. And I can tell you, I get dozens, hundreds of emails from people, uh, conversations. I, I'm hearing firsthand the, the side effects that are happening to people, the concerns that they're witnessing. I'm hearing it from physicians who have seen it in their own families, who are afraid to talk about this. While this became more clear, the vaccine push grew even more intense politicians and the media began to actively demonize unvaccinated Canadians. Farouchement opposés à la vaccination. Ils sont extrémistes. Qui croient pas dans la science, qui sont souvent misogynes, qui souvent racistes aussi. C'est un, 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 un petit groupe, mais qui prend de la place. Et là, il faut faire un choix en tant que leader, en tant que pays. In a snap election campaign, Trudeau's Liberals promised that if re-elected, they would put the screws to the unvaccinated Canadians, barring them from boarding trains or planes and from working for the federal government. On the eve of the election call, Justin Trudeau declared vaccinations for federal civil servants mandatory. This is the choice people need to make and we will make no apologies for continuing to put forward measures that encourage people to get vaccinated and protect those who are doing the right thing and getting vaccinated. They promised to commit $1 billion to help the Canadian provinces develop digital vaccine passport systems, which would effectively bar unvaccinated citizens from participating in the social life of their communities. Across the country, they're stepping up to get vaccinated, to keep each other safe. They also vowed to remove legal protections for people who lost their jobs due to vaccine status. I think that everyone still has the right to do what they want to with their bodies, but the employers and the government have a right to say, if you don't do this, then these are the consequences. An employee who's let go is entitled to, you know, either severance uh, and EI benefits uh, when they're not guilty of misconduct. 
The question is, what constitutes misconduct? Yesterday, when asked about employees flouting vaccine mandates, the employment minister weighed in. It's a condition of employment that hasn't been met, and the employer choosing to terminate someone for that reason would make that person ineligible for EI. With barely 20% of the eligible voters, Trudeau's Liberal Party was re-elected with 32% of the vote. Many government officials determined how to circumvent traditional checks and balances by invoking the word science and demonizing anyone who questioned their narrative as anti-science. Those brave enough to open a dialogue found themselves cancelled and ostracized from society. Government is our greatest concern now, quite frankly. They, in my view, are seeking much greater control and they're getting control. When you look at the, the COVID pandemic, they are scaring people to death. And when people live in a world of, of fear, then they just it just eradicates their lives. They go along with whatever, not because they agree with it, but because they feel they have no choice and they're scared for their lives. It became very clear that the vaccination was not stopping the spread. It was self-evident. And you still have this dogmatism that we have to pressure everybody into it. The, the false promise that we would get rid of lockdowns forever if, uh, if everybody got the vaccine. And just the denunciation of, of anybody who disagrees with it. Many felt it was a scapegoating ploy. Tensions were high and people were upset. Constant policy changes diminished trust in our institutions, and Canadians were at a crossroad. My employer has just mandated that I must get a vaccine for COVID-19. My school employs me to be an authority on the subject of ethics. It's ethically wrong to coerce someone to take a vaccine. If you don't want a COVID vaccine, don't take one. End of discussion. I, I had no opinion whether it was good or bad because it's not my choice, that's your choice. And so at first I was like, yeah, that's cool. You know, if they want people to get vaccinated, you know, people are gonna make their own choices based on their own autonomy. And a lot of people decided that it was a good idea for them. But the more that the media and the governments had pushed this and made it more of something forced, and part of their coercion was shaming the people that weren't getting it. There was a big separation starting to happen. And then it became the vaccinated and the non-vaccinated. We really have all been duped. I have the utmost compassion for those who are still refusing to see another side of the story. And there's no way to know where this could lead. Once we've normalized internal passports for vaccine status, what's to stop governments from using the same system for other things? Other personal data could be appended to these systems. Your Google search history, your social networks, your political or religious views, where you've been and with whom. What if one day your QR code flags you as undesirable based on criteria that is illogical, immoral, or even unknown. That's not what freedom is about. That's not what privacy is about. It is usurping the role of individuals and personal control. Privacy is all about personal control over the use and disclosure of your personal information. That's what freedom is about. I think it's an interesting idea, but uh, I think it is also fraught with challenges, creating knock-on undesirable effects in our community. I think uh, the indications that the vast majority of Canadians are looking to get vaccinated uh, will get us to a good place without having to, uh, to take uh, uh, more extreme measures that could have uh, real divisive uh, impacts on, on community and country. 
in about a week's time, Ontario will follow other provinces, including Quebec and British Columbia, and issue a form of vaccine passport, a proof of, uh, of the fact that you have been vaccinated in order to access certain businesses or services. What are the privacy concerns and other issues that this raises for citizens? When you're trying to target uh, you know, a certain demographic of people who clearly didn't want to get the vaccine in an environment where our vaccination rates were already at 90% in a place like Alberta, it seemed a bit excessive. What's your position on vaccine passports for those individuals unwilling to be vaccinated? Opposed. And we've been very clear from the beginning that we will not facilitate or accept vaccine passports. Today, the World Health Organization warned of the global risk from this new variant, Omicron. Even after multiple vaccine doses and a year of lockdowns, this wave exceeded all others. Cases skyrocketed, vaccinated or not. Any positive sign the end of this pandemic was within reach is now in the rearview mirror again. Most importantly, what did it do against Omicron? <laughs> and against Omicron um, here in Canada, which kicked in mid-December, there was no benefit from the perspective of being vaccinated and preventing transmission. Any possible justification for socially segregating unvaccinated Canadians had disappeared. It was then that the Trudeau government introduced a vaccine mandate for cross-border truckers. Right now, I got, we got a few uh, people that are not vaccinated, so they're not going to be able to come. I, I'm getting extra money for coming over. There's a whole bunch of pressures on mandates in general. Businesses hate them, businesses love them. I mean, I got to tell you, I'm a lot more concerned about my 13-year-old bringing Omicron home from school than I am getting it from a long-haul truck driver. Well, it might be a problem. I don't know. It's going to be interesting, though. So these truckers were taking it upon themselves to try something different, i.e. convoy, and say, you know what? This is about our freedoms, our freedoms of choice, our freedoms to choose what we think is best for us and for our children. For me, I knew early on it was going to be it was going to be big, that, you know, and because I mean, as they started to roll these trucks out of BC coming to Alberta, there's no doubt it was going to be big. And I could just feel the love, and I could feel the unity, and it had nothing really to do with the vaccines themselves. Man, we just want to come to support these truckers and thank the truckers for rising up when all of us were needing someone to rise up. This belief around personal choice and, and freedom, informed consent, patient autonomy, and those bring people together. And, and that, that aspect of it um, has been very, very positive. I just think that every single Canadian needs to know what really happened and needs to understand what we're standing for, what we're fighting for, because we're fighting for the next generation. And it's a fight. They're giving a nation hope. But you know what's dangerous here is that that they can just as quickly lose hope. For me, the, the concern was, was it going to be a weak stand or a strong stand, you know? The downside to the beautiful thing that I saw was the government and social media working in coercion with each other to really turn something so truthful and beautiful into something that it wasn't. It was like, yes. Um, and I remember seeing the videos of them starting in Vancouver and my, having heart palpitations and trying to think, oh, should I get in the car? Should I follow them? Should I take the kids? I'll make it into some kind of homeschooling project about freedom, it'll be great. You know, I called a friend of mine and, and I had been talking to her about this convoy and she says, oh, you mean the white supremacist movement? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I already know like so many people involved and I know that it wasn't a white supremacist movement. It wasn't a, a movement of, of any fringe minority. This was a movement of, of love, man. It's a matter of time, guys. I'm a peaceful man. I do not agree with how our leaders are treating us, how the elite is doing whatever they're doing. It was so big that even the 
uh, biased media who are seeking only to promote the government's narrative, they had to cover it whether they wanted to or not. this convoy no dude i'm gonna send you a link but you should check it out and you're my first call you're the only one wild enough to go i'd like to go in and film this thing what do you say let me sleep on it i'll call you back in the morning all right man Oh! 